Thanks a lot. That was extremely moving. And listening to, to Lorna was just, it was just exhilarating, to be frank. I want to give apologies for Jeremy Corbyn, first of all. He would have liked to have been here today. Um, it's our first meeting of the Parliamentary Labour Party today that he'll be addressing. And it's going to be interesting what the atmosphere is going to be like this time round. Because, as you know, sometimes the Parliamentary Labour Party have not been as generous, shall we say, to Jeremy as maybe they should have been. I think today they certainly will be. So he sends his apologies, but he also wants me to say this as well. He wants to say just thanks. Thanks to this union in particular. Thanks to all of you. Because, you know, over the last couple of years, since Jeremy first muted that he was going to stand for the leadership, this union has been with him every step of the way, in some of the most difficult times as well. It was this union that helped us get him onto that ballot paper in the first instance, if you remember. So I gave Ronnie and Ian a ring and said, look, could you talk to some Labour MPs because we're short of a few nominations and we might need a few at the end. And I'd promised everything to everyone I possibly could to get him on the ballot paper. Promised to sleep with some of them, but they never took it up. But there you are. <laughs> Anything I could do to get him on. And it was as a result of some of the pressure that you exerted, we just got him on. And if you remember, cast your mind back then, Everyone thought Jeremy was a no-hoper, no-hoper. He was 200 to 1 outside. I never put a bet on. I regret it now, not a penny. 200 to 1 outsider. And yet what he did, if you remember, he started touring around the country, talking at meetings, hustings, debates. And the first televised debate was in Nuneaton. And then people saw what he was about, both in terms of what he was saying, in terms of his policies, but also his individual character as well. Four weeks into that campaign, we thought we could win. And as a result of the mobilization that you, this union, put in and supported us, yes, with some funding, but also talking to Labour Party members, yes, we won. And we won a huge victory for him. And, it, and at that point in time, some of you will remember you know, we won with an overwhelming victory as a result of that mobilization of rank and file members, despite some elements within the party hierarchy itself. And then we went through a period in which we were winning elections, parliamentary by-elections, local government results, mayoral elections, but then the referendum came and we had the coup. And I want to say thank you again, because it was this union that stood beside us in that coup. When, those shadow, when that Shadow Cabinet members resigned and we were asking others to come forward, we, this union helped us in persuading others to stand. And in the most difficult circumstances, it was this union that gave us 100% support. So I just want to say thank you for that as well. And you know, <laughs> we had the second leadership campaign. And again, at, the, <laughs> at that point in time, the establishment started to move against us in earnest because we'd won once when they turned a blind eye. They didn't think we had a chance, but the establishment then started coming at us. And that's when the media started ranking up their attacks on us on a most personal way, in some bizarre ways as well. I think I told you last year with me they, and with Jeremy, they went around every part of our families interviewing them. And I was married before and I was divorced and um, they went to my wife, my ex-wife and her partner is a good friend of mine, and the Daily Mail said, we'll give you money and we'll write the interview. And they phoned me up, my ex-wife phoned me up and said, well, we told them to sod off, we told them to turn them away, we're not going to do that. I said, you should have taken the money. You could have had a decent holiday on the backs of the Daily Mail, why not? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that went on. Only the weekend before last, my, my current, my wife is going, my wife is going. Her family, her mum and dad, are in their 80s, they're retired, and they're back in Goa in the family home. The mail sent a journalist and a photographer out there Sunday before last and wheedled their way into their home. Now, these are eight, eight, they're 84, my mother-in-law. 
My stepfather-in-law is 85, and he's got respiratory and heart conditions, very frail. But they wheeled their way into their home to take photos. And what were they asking? They were asking, did, did me and my wife own property in Goa? Well, we don't. We don't. But that's the lengths they went to in terms of putting pressure on all our families. And it's been dreadful for Jeremy as well. The best one, I think I told you, they put an advert in one of the newspapers saying, did you, do you know John MacDonald? And a woman wrote in and said, yes, I, I went to primary school with him. And he used to sit beside me at primary school. And when the, the nuns used to have their maths tests, he used to whisper the answers to me. And she they published the letter. And I thought, oh, that's really lovely. And then they went, yeah, what a, always knew he was a cheat. <laughs> Just extraordinary. And it went on and on. Anyway, you stood beside us then with a coup, and Jeremy got re-elected with a bigger majority. And we thought then, we thought then, well, that's established the leadership, and let's now get on in terms of the campaign and build and build it as best we could. And that's what we've, we've tried to do. Now, again, what, when Theresa May announced on seven occasions that, we, that there would be no snap general election, we knew automatically there would be, because when could you ever trust a Tory Prime Minister? <laughs> so we prepared from last November, we prepared for last November this election campaign. And what were the contents of it? Well, the most important thing for us was actually to get the policies right. Now, I've been at each of your conferences in re recent years, and we've discussed those policies. And I've talked to a number of your branches, your executive, and I've done the same with a number of other unions and also with Labour Party branches and members all over the country as well. And that manifesto was constructed on the basis of the ideas of our rank and file members. Not some great intellectual exercise above everybody else as has happened in the past where there's been no dialogue or consultation. It was about the real life experiences of our members and members of our community. And that's how we constructed it. And you know, I think it was right. I think it was right. It struck a chord because it did represent what people are experiencing at the moment. And what they're experiencing at the moment, to be frank, after seven years of austerity, is some of the hardest times that we've seen in generations. You know, it can't be right. We're the fifth richest economy in the world. And it can't be right, can it? In the fifth richest country in the world, last year, a million and a quarter had to turn up at food banks and be given food. And it can't be right, can it, that most of those people you know were in work. And that RCN, Royal College of Nurses report, only a few weeks ago, that said nurses because of the freeze on pay, 14% cut in seven years, are having to go to food banks to feed themselves. What do you call that? I call that a bloody disgrace, don't you? A disgrace. Because, you know, we're, it's drilled into us, isn't it? Go to work, earn your pay, and as a result of that, you'll be able to support yourself and your family. Not under this government, not after a pay freeze effectively for the past seven years across the public sector and the private sector, 10% below our wages now than they were in 2007, 2008. But they're not below if you're a chief executive or a director of a FTSE 100 company, because what they're earning at the moment, they're earning 182 times the average wage of their companies. What a disgrace. So it's all right for the few, but for the many, it's wage cuts and wage freezes. And that's what they'd planned to roll out for the next five years when they went into this election itself. And I tell you what's right, a government that can't feed itself, doesn't exert, feed its population, doesn't exert, deserve to exist. But also, you know, we've got a homelessness crisis now that we haven't seen since the Second World War. And it isn't just people sleeping on the streets and in the parks along the canal, in my constituency in particular, but it's also the overcrowding. The number of children that are being brought up in temporary accommodation, where you're licensed 
and you're moving every 18 months or two years. You can never settle at school. You can never have stable friends because you'll be at another school in a couple of years' time because your rent, your license, your tenancy agreement, your short life tenancy agreement is run out. And you know, we've got a homelessness crisis we've not seen on this scale. Well, actually, even in terms of house building since the 1920s. And then when you do go to work, when you do go to work, you know, we've got four million kids in this country officially, government figures, four million living in poverty. Two thirds of them are in families where someone's at work. And you know, they talk about pensioners and intergenerational justification. We've still got two million pensioners in this country that are living in poverty. And they say about winter fuel allowance and withdrawing it from the millions, 30,000 of our pensioners every year die as a result of cold-related conditions every winter. It doesn't happen in Scandinavia where it's a lot colder. Why does it happen here? Because people are living in poverty, they can't heat their homes, and the homes are not insulated. Fifth richest country in the world can't feed our population, can't house our population, can't get them into jobs where they can support themselves, and our pensioners are dying of cold every winter in their tens of thousands. That's what made us so angry that we want to get rid of this government permanently. <laughs> and, the and the manifesto, the manifesto we put forward based upon your ideas was straightforward, wasn't it? That if where there's homelessness and housing crises, we will build the homes. We'll build a million new homes. Half of them, yes, let's use the term properly, because I was proud to be brought up in one, will be council homes. That's what we want again. Decent rents and decent standards. And yes, when our people are sick, they will be treated in the NHS, and that NHS will be properly funded, the staff will be properly paid, and we'll stop them profiteering from it by privatisation. Because that's what the NHS staff themselves are telling us. And yes, we've believed always that actually when you go to work, you deserve a decent wage. And I tell you, I am so proud of this union. It was this union that started the campaign for £10 an hour. It was this union that started the fast food campaign. It was this union that took its members out on strike to deserve a decent pay. And you know, you've infected the whole of the trade union movement. You've infected it in such a way it's now Labour Party policy. But it's not good enough, is it, just to get the decent pay one year and not have it the next. And the only way, you know as well as I, the only way you protect your pay is by joining a union. That's why we've said, and this isn't revolutionary, we've said we will restore trade union rights in this country because we just want the same as everyone else. We want, we just want governments in the future to abide by the law. The International Labour Con Organization Conventions. It's good enough for the rest of Europe, why isn't it good enough for here? And that's why we said to the Tories, and we warned them, and we told them time and time again, it will stand true as well when we go into net power, I hope, over the next 12 months. As soon as we get into power, we'll restore trade union rights, but within the first 100 days, we will scrap the Trade Union Act, which was brought forward to destroy trade unions in this country. Now, a lot's, a lot's been said about the mobilization of young people in this campaign. It's just been fantastic. It's just been brilliant. The enthusiasm has been enormous. And the people we've attracted to us in all different ways. There was a, a group of our supporters who put together a computer game, or an app called Corbyn Run, where Jeremy's running along, shakes up bankers, money drops out of their pockets, <laughs> it's score, and every time you get a certain amount, you can introduce a new progressive policy. Do you know within 24 hours of that being produced, a million hits on that one game? Wow. And then you had all these grime, I didn't know what a grime artist was, but you had all these grime artists. I met a bloke called the Rag and Bone Man. He's, a, he's just superb, he's a brilliant singer. And they just said, we believe in what you're doing. And anything we can do to help to get young people registered. Why? Because the Tories said this, 
They said, yeah, you might mobilize the youth, but it doesn't matter because they just don't vote. Well, they did this time, didn't they? They did this time. And it's interesting, you know, it's interesting. On the one hand, the Tories were relying upon the young people not to vote, and at the same time, they were relying upon older people always to support them. And then they, <laughs> then they said, we'll scrap the triple lock. They said then we'll get rid of winter fuel allowance to 10 million of them. And then also they, they introduced the concept of the dementia attack, where a lot of older people started getting anxious, understandably. And they looked for an alternative, and that alternative was us. Why? Because we were giving them security. We said we'll maintain the winter fuel. We will not introduce a means test. Why? Because as soon as you introduce a means test, large numbers of people never claim. And that's what's happened with pension credit. And we weren't willing to allow them to take away the winter fuel allowance or allow more pensioners this winter to die of cold. It was as simple as that. And on the triple lock, the triple lock is completely affordable as you grow the economy. And you know the triple lock isn't just for older people, it's for the younger people who will be pensioners eventually. Aren't. And if we allow them to get rid of it, it will undermine the pensions for the future. And we'll have more than two million, as we have now, pensioners living in poverty. All of that we put together, but what the young people in together, what we, uh, in particular, <coughs> what we were concerned about was large numbers of them who desperately need training into skills. We're not getting it because of the four billion cut the toys are introduced on the adult skills budget and for young people. And also because of the withdrawal of education maintenance allowance, forcing young people even to take out loans to get skills training. And then if they went on to higher education to be saddled with 40, 50,000 pounds worth of debt. So that's why we said, and it's a, it's a belief. I mentioned it here at a previous conference. It's a deep belief for all of us that education is a gift from one generation to another. It is not a commodity to be bought and sold. That's why we said we'd scrap tuition fees once and for all. And you know, I've said as well, as soon as we have the time is right, as soon as we can afford it to, whatever mechanisms we can identify. I want to go further than that. I want to see if we can scrap the debt that is burdening existing students as well. Now the, <laughs> you know, the Tories are attacked us for that, saying it's pie in the sky and all the rest. The tuition fee system is collapsing already. Half the tuition fees are never paid back anyway. So the system is already in crisis, and this is one way in which we can lift that crisis off the backs of young people and actually ensure it's properly shared. And how do we do that? And this is what really got to them, isn't it? What they didn't like at all is we just muted the concept that for once, maybe in generations, just for once, we might have a fair taxation system in this country. You know? We said all we asked for, all we asked for, is to stop the tax giveaways to the rich and the corporations. Why? Because they said if you cut the tax, it's trickle-down economics, cut the taxes to the, the rich and the corporations, somehow this will trickle down, the corporations will start investing. No, they weren't. They're sitting on nearly 600 billion pounds worth of earned income not being invested. And what they're doing is, is bumping up their share prices so they can get additional bonuses through various manipulations. But we also said, wouldn't it be good wouldn't it be good if we could just be in a, in, live in a country where the rich paid their taxes, where the corporations stopped evading and avoiding? And at the same time, all we said was 5% of the richest and the corporations make a, small, a bigger, slightly bigger contribution. 95% of the population, no increase in income tax, all VAT or national insurance. And I wanted to go further as well because we, we can actually get in a situation where as we grow the economy and more consumer spending takes place, we can use that to start reducing VAT as well because VAT falls mostly on working people. And that was our objective. And you know, they hated it. They invented slogans all through the campaign. It was, they were going around like, well, I don't know, what you, they were going like oh, something out of Doctor Who, strong and stable, strong and stable, all this sort of stuff. It was, Dal it was Dalek type campaign, wasn't it? But then the other thing was the magic money tree. And I thought Paul Mason was very good on the magic money tree. I don't know whether you saw him. He was interviewed. He says, there is a magic money tree. There is. There is one, definitely. It's in the Panama. And it's in the Bahamas, in the Cayman Islands. And actually, Amber Rudd and her numbers have got their bank accounts in those countries. 
So we just wanted a fair taxation system. In that way, we could invest in our public services. We could lift people's wages and standard of living. And that's what excited people, that manifesto. And then you saw the Tory manifesto, contentless, and I said time and time again, the only figures in the Tory manifesto were the page numbers. Nothing else added up. Nothing else added up. <laughs> but then I think the other thing that did it as well, yes, we had all the abuse on Jeremy Corbyn and myself, because of what? Because we've campaigned over the years when others wouldn't for peace. And we talk to people for peace. And we talk to people for peace. And do you know what was amazing? We were condemned for doing that in the 1980s. But whilst we were doing it, the government was doing it, but in secret, the Thatcher government. And we were lambasted, accused of supporting terrorism and all the rest, all through by the Daily Mail, The Sun, and all the, all the other right-wing newspapers. But what I said at the beginning, we were 20 points behind in the polls, and I said, the po polls will narrow. No one believed me. But I said, as soon as we can get political balance in broadcasting, because the law requires that in a general election, we can get Jeremy actually on air, people will see what an honest, decent, principled person he is, and also what a strong character he is as well. And that's exactly what happened. The polls narrowed, and do you know, if we'd only had a week longer, we would have won, because we would have gone ahead. He Whereas Theresa May refused to have any de live debate, toured around the country just meeting Tory party members and apparatchiks, Jeremy toured around the country and did every debate he possibly could. And people turned up in their tens of thousands at these, at these rallies, etc. And it just it demonstrated to me, whatever the polls were saying, whatever the media were saying, there was a subterranean movement going on. That the earth was moving as a result of the message that we were putting out and that message was one of hope. So I want to say this in conclusion, you know. When people ask you in the future, and they will, when people ask you when everything was thrown against the Labour Party, when they mobilised all the resources to destroy Jeremy Corbyn and John MacDonald and the Labour Party, I want you to be able to say this to them. I stood with Corbyn. I stood with Corbyn. And when they'll ask you, Future generations will ask you, your children, your grandchildren, they'll ask you, what did you do when they came to privatise the NHS and cut school budgets, lay off teachers and attack the disabled? I want you to say, and say it proudly, I stood with Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> and, when, and when they ask you why, tell them this, because I believe that hope will always overcome fear. That kindness and generosity will always overcome selfish greed. And that they will never, ever extinguish the flame of solidarity in this movement we've created. Solidarity. Thank you.